Good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm Martin. This is uh, Liz. We are both from Red Hat's cockpit team. And I must say, thank you so much for coming here. We are competing against Sunday and the social event and the system D talk. So I actually feel kind of honored that we have such a great attendance today. Um, so for this talk, we assume some basic familiarity with cockpit. But if you have really never seen it, here's the short, short version. So Cockpit is conceptually a Linux session that runs in your web browser. And we try to make it to be the mobile equivalent of what GNOME is to a desktop. So this is the UI for your server. And so it uh, is a tool for experimentation, for learning how Linux works, for uh, newcomers, also for troubleshooting. You put a lot of effort into that. And also for doing infrequent tasks that you don't keep in your head, like how do I resize my LVM or something. <clears throat> ah, yeah, I just talked to this. So to understand this talk, you need to know a little bit about how Cockpit works internally. So consider what happens with a normal interactive SSH session at the bottom. So you want to do stuff on some remote server, which is sitting out there. And this stuff usually entails you want uh, running programs or doing something with files. Perhaps you want to talk to a TCP port and so on. But everything that SSH gives you is essentially a pair of textual pipes, standard in and standard out. So you need something to put in between that translates between these two text streams and all the operating system interfaces. And for a normal interactive SSH session, this is usually a shell like bash that most people use. And now Cockpit is in a web UI written in JavaScript, but it's actually in the same situation. The, uh, it is running in a browser, possibly on the other side of the world. And the only thing that it has is a protocol called WebSocket. For the purposes of this talk, it's essentially the same as a, uh, a two-way pipe. So you also have a text stream there and text stream back. And for Cockpit, this thing in the middle, which translates in between these two sides, is called Cockpit Bridge. And that is the thing that uh, is essentially a multiplex JSON stream uh, that, that translates all these operating system interfaces to the, the WebSocket protocol that the uh, user interface can understand. So how does that look like? Time for demo. Um, this is the Cockpit Flatpak. If you have never seen it, uh, we believe it's the easiest way to, to consume Cockpit. So it is essentially a very minimal web browser, WebKit based, and the Cockpit web server and an SSH client wrapped into a flat pack. So here you can connect to pretty much any SSH target. So you can give it an IP, host name, SSH alias, username, and so on. So let's try what happens if I connect to my Fedora server. I don't have SSH keys set up, so I just enter my password here. Super secret, foobar. This is dark mode. Well, Okay, and so here you have the, <laughs> yeah, might look better on video, thanks. So here you have the, the, the familiar cockpit user interface where you can do things. And I don't want to go too much into detail here because I assume you already know that. And if you, if you look here what's running, you see there's the SSH process and it runs as the first thing, this cockpit bridge thing I've just been telling you about. And uh, we open the terminal page here. So the terminal page is this bash process. That's the thing I'm currently in. And I was running the PSFX. So far, so good. And this works. Oops. Oop. So this works because the Fedora server has a bunch of cockpit packages pre-installed. <coughs> okay. So now let's put ourselves in the position of cockpit and SSH to this manually. And what we can do is we can run the, the same cockpit bridge in some kind of slightly easier to use from a human uh, mode. So now I need to, where's the notes? Okay. No, sure, yeah, ah, yeah. So the cockpit bridge works, as I said, it's a multiplex JSON stream and it works in terms of channels. So what we can do is, for example, run a program. 
How do I mark stuff here? Okay, so we can paste that in. Control Shift C. Sorry, it's not my laptop. <laughs> ah, yeah. So what we see here is we open the channel and we get a, a bunch. Oops. I do this. Yeah. So we open the channel. Uh, it's uh, it worked, and then we got a, a bunch of uh, standard standard out blobs. So as they come in, so it's uh, coming in chunks, as we know from ping, and eventually. The, the command finishes and gives an exit code and says that it's done. And the bridge has a lot of these channels. So there you can do file operations, you can do dbus calls, uh, or uh, for example, a, a more specialized one would be metrics. So this is the second one, oh yeah, thank you. So here we, we open a metrics channel that measures the current CPU usage. Of course, the numbers here are all very small because this VM doesn't really do anything. But I hope you can see by now this is the idea of what cockpit bridges at the guts. And everything that the UI does is implemented in terms of these channels. OK. We can run it on things that aren't Fedora, right? Absolutely, of course. I mean, we support cockpit on a lot of operating systems, so like Debian, Arch, uh, Ubuntu, and OpenSUSE and so on. So of course we can also ask the flat pack. I stopped that. <laughs> I think you did it in this one, but you SSH'd afterwards. Ah, sorry, yeah. So I just, uh, for the talk, I brought up a CentOS, 7, a CentOS 9 stream cloud instance. So let's connect to this. And of course cloud instances usually have your SSH key set up. So we don't even need to type in our keys. And of course, as you see, uh, it's the same cockpit interface that you are used to, and it's the same ease of Martin, use. And Martin, hold on, hold on. What, what? This is embarrassing. What, what, what? Command not found. Oh, really? Oh, you forgot to install cockpit on the server. This is totally yeah. screwing up our talk, man. Yeah, really. No, this is, yeah, this is a bit sad. I mean, uh, this is one of our flagship products, right? I mean, yeah, it's like real it's, and, I mean, I mean, screw users and, and, and customers, but I think this makes us look seriously okay, uncool okay. now. We, we need, okay, we need a solution, we need a fast. Um, okay, uh, what, what language did you say this cockpit base is written? I'm not familiar. So, what can we do here? Like, um, uh, I mean, you need to have that bridge pre-installed somehow, right? I mean, it's okay, a C I, program. I okay. So we, we can compile it. Yeah, but I mean, it's a C program so that it's performant and we can uh, talk to low-level system interfaces and like, uh, but I mean, this doesn't work. I mean, how do we get the bridge there without having the bridge? This is taking too long, man. Like we have, we like our talk. He's going to start showing like the ten minute sign and stuff. Okay. So what do we do, Liz? Uh, I, um, we could rewrite the bridge in Python. In Python? Yeah. No, 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 no. This no. will make it easier. I promise. No, no, no. That can never work. I mean, everybody knows Python is way too slow, and I mean, the, the, the C bridge is thousands of lines of code. It will take us years to to re-implement this. And anyway, I mean, even if you do rewrite it in Python, how do you get it? to the other machine, right? I mean, seriously, people, I ask you, my friends, what has the Python Empire ever done for us? <laughs> hey, nothing, right? Not terrible. Hmm? Terrible, nothing. Nothing, really. Yeah, that's what but I'm saying. It's portable. It's portable. Yeah, OK, it's portable. I yeah, yeah, I give you that. But I mean, otherwise, not really much, right? It's kind of like, it's really easy to write async code. Like, I think there's a lot of that in the cockpit bridge. And like, we have all these callbacks, and it's annoying. And you don't have to deal with that with Python. Yeah, but I'm sure that's way too slow. No, it's actually performant. The async code really? Yeah, yeah, OK, so it's fast enough, and it's portable. Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, but still, I mean, this, this can be good enough, right? Yeah, okay, it's efficient and fast to develop, but yeah, well, I know, I'm, I'm really skeptical, right? I mean, also, like, I it's mean, not the 80s anymore, man. Yeah, okay, but aside from being a modern language and being available everywhere and being portable and being easy to develop in and being asynchronous and being really fast, I mean, what has the Python empire ever done for us? Okay, um, let me slow you down here. I, I wrote this program, actually, in Python. Um, it's called Hello World. Uh, maybe you heard of it. Um, what? It's yeah. You're a super lead Hold hacker. on, I'm going to have to show this to you. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, yeah, and you can actually run this program in places where it's not installed. Um, and I Hello you world. Yeah. I'm, I'm, it's I'm it's super complex, I know, yeah, but yeah. Let, me, let me give it a shot. Yeah, 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 do that. 
Um, so we use this, um, we have this idea of running programs in places they aren't installed. Um, wh where have we seen this before? Um, we actually have the ability, uh, quite normally, that you could uh, have a program not installed on your computer, you go to a website, and the website wants you to have this program. So it uses this mix of uh, pervasive technology um, in the form of a protocol, which is HTTP. Uh, everybody has HTTP on their server or client. And then we have this um, absolutely ubiquitous execution environment, which is JavaScript, HTML, CSS. Um, and then you can get applications from one place uh, to a place where they're not installed and people can run them. So we sort of thought like, maybe we turn this idea on its head. Um, and we can use a uh, ubiquitous protocol, SSH, and an ubiquitous execution environment, Python. And um, we can use this for having programs that live on the client that get sent to the server. So the client tells the server what it wants to do, basically. It's the other way around. And this uh, particular stack of technology, like SSH and Python, that's like Ansible world. This is pretty widely supported on almost any server, except extremely minimal ones. And we built some tools for helping us do this. So Byboat is um, the first of these tools. And it's basically a way of taking um, a Python interpreter. So anywhere you can get a Python interpreter. Uh, you can then run a complex uh, an interactive Python program in it. And um, this idea that an interpreter can be running in a different environment, um, what is this meaning? So we have all of these kinds of commands. Um, uh, probably a lot of people are familiar with these that are basically run some command somewhere else in a different context and connect me like the input and the output and let me see what's going on with that command. So the one we mostly care about in the case we're demoing here is SSH, but also like, you know, sudo do something, uh, is running the same command but is root. Or you could run it inside of a container, or um, if you're familiar with this command, if you're inside of a flat pack, that gets you access to the host system from inside the flat pack if you have the right permissions for that. Um, and the command in question that we might be interested in running, um, why not Python? So, uh, now, if, if you look at all of these commands when you run it, um, they all basically present you with the same interface, which is a Python interpreter, and you can type stuff into it, and you can see what comes out of it. Uh, and this is what Byboat needs to do what it does. And the next technology we have that enables this is called BIPAC. And the problem is that you have like a Python program, and it's like a billion lines of code split across like a bunch of different files. Maybe you use some modules. Um, you can't just put all of these files into the Python interpreter and expect it to work. So we basically have a way of taking um, a complex program split over many files and modules and turning them into a single Python script. And let's use um, some loader magic in import lib. It basically is its own importer. And uh, yeah, you, you end up with a single script which has many files inside of it. Um, it basically takes all the files, puts them into a Python dictionary and then puts that into the loader and then adds the loader to the path. And we have, as I was saying, like this hello world uh, demo. Uh, yeah, and we, we know ZipApp exists, uh, but there's some problems with it. Um, like you have to write it to the disk before you can run it. It has to be like on a physical path that's um, on the disk. And we wanted to just send it over SSH and go. So here is um, this demo that I put together. We have an app, and you know it's like a standard hello world kind of thing, um, but it's using libraries because, you know, getting the Python version is pretty complicated. Getting the name of the OS you're using pretty complicated. So of course we need a library for that. We we like modularity, um, and that library is just looking like this, and it has a bunch of functions in it. So if you were to try and run hello.py, like on another machine, you would need to make sure at least these two files are getting over. And that's not the kind of thing that you can do in the interpreter, just sending it with standard in. Um, so what we can do then is, if we run this command, um, then this creates a bypack of these two files. Um, and this can get quite complicated. The things that bypack can do are uh, modules. It can actually like do a pep 517 build of a source tree. Um, but for the, the sake of argument here, we just do these files. And just like um, the zip app, if you're familiar with it, you can say, here's a bunch of files. Um, they form like a Python library, but what are you going to do? I import them all and then nothing happens. You need a place to start out, so you can say, here's where the main function lives. 
And it's basically saying, put it in here. And if you look at what's in here, you see that um, it's actually this code. And it gets stored into a dictionary form. Um, here's hello.py, part of the dictionary. And here's um, the infos.py. And this is all just in one ginormous dictionary. And that gets passed to this uh, VIPack loader, which implements some import lib magic uh, that lets you import your program and run it, just like a normal Python program. Um, and this turns out to be pretty flexible. Um, you can, you can basically do everything you could do in normal Python. Um, you can do imports of other modules. You can do like, even if you have binary data files and you use um, the resource loader in import lib, this is working with this. Uh, and we, we make use of all of these features, um, which is quite nice. Um, yeah, so uh, I mentioned before that we have Bybot. And this is this um, thing that works with the Bypack. And the idea is when you build your software, you would make a bypack ahead of time. And this is sort of like your main deliverable. And then Bybot can consume this bypack. So right, up. And then it can deliver it to different environments. If you just run Bybot on its own, um, it does the thing that I mentioned. It gets you a Python interpreter somewhere. Um, but if you run it with this, um, then it will run that application somewhere. And by default, that somewhere is here. So it'll just run the Python interpreter here. <laughs> and yeah. So you notice the lizard toolbox? That's just. Uh, yeah, so this is in the current environment um, in the toolbox. And uh, what, what's interesting to note is that we're blasting this program over standard in, but the standard in is still available for interaction with the user. Um, so it, it basically, we use the standard in to get the program up and running, but it's not like we just cat the Python script into standard in because then you send EOF and it's game over. Um, so we have this sort of multi-stage bootloader process that we can continue communicating with the application after we boot it. And yeah, as promised, like you can SSH to the Fedora server, and then uh, we see that we're logged in here. And I'm still Rupert, I guess. And um, I can do this with sudo. And then you can see now I'm root in my toolbox. Um, and I mentioned before, you can escape the toolbox. And now I am out on my laptop. You can see that it's on silver blue on my laptop. And this is, um, this is basically like this core enabling technology that we wanted to do in order to make this possible. Uh, and one feature that we have in this, which is kind of like, uh, it's a little bit crazy to talk about, but we gave the machine the ability to reproduce itself. Um, I, I know this, like I've seen some sci-fi movies, this usually goes poorly. But this is important for our case um, because um, we have the case that when you SSH to a remote machine with cockpit, you have cockpit running as your admin user. That's nice. But most of the stuff you need to do, you need to run as root. And the way that works with uh, cockpit is that uh, there's a concept of a peer bridge. And cockpit will start sudo and then run another bridge under it and run um, it basically the same program again. And if it's installed on the local machine and user bin cockpit, that's great. You can just say sudo user bin cockpit. But here we need to take this program that's running and has no files on disk whatsoever and run something over sudo. And the thing that we can run over sudo is, again, another Python interpreter. And then the first program can pass its own code to the second program. And the way that works is Bybot has a stage one bootloader, which is the very first thing that gets sent to the Python interpreter. And it takes the, the source code that it ends up downloading from the client, more or less. And it passes that in this special variable, um, which is recognized by the bypack loader. If that's present, then that dictionary, which I showed before, it gets added with the same name that it had on the host back to that dictionary. So you can have a program that says, OK, import this bypack, send it somewhere else. And then from that place that the copy of this program is running, it can further import that same bypack in exactly the same way and send it on further. So I think yeah. uh, we're ready to demo how we use this in cockpit now. <coughs> So yeah, remember that uh, CentOS 9 stream machine that was so stubborn for us to log in? Uh, I think uh, I know where I'm now. <laughs> so, no. where was the test? Uh, it's on the next one. Next one, ah yeah, all right. So let's close this old and non-functioning one and use the super cool one. This is, um, yeah. This one is currently available on the beta channel on Flathead if you want to give it a try. So. 
we log into CentOS 9 stream, and magic happens. We get a cockpit. It's apparently not super healthy when services fail, but you notice that it's got a lot of a lot more available pages here. And yeah, this is magic, right? Yeah, it's pretty cool. And um, let's see what's running in the terminal. Yeah, absolutely. You see now, no cockpit bridge anymore. It's now this, uh, like this is exactly the Python interpreter which got all the bridge piped in. And that's it, right? I mean, nobody else does need more features. Um, we could become root. Root? Oh, well, that's even more magic, right? Well, let's see how that works. Uh, yeah, the machine can replicate itself. Oh. And I am root. It says I have administrative powers. Let's check that. Let's say we change the host name to, I don't know, something. Oh. <laughs> and yes, it changed it. We are root. Um, and yeah, this is basically, it's calling sudo, and then this is running the contained bridge, just as we described. Liz, I think that restored our coolness, right? <laughs> okay, so um, where can you get get this? So, and what is our plan for this? So, we've been developing this Python bridge uh, in the last uh, for the last couple of months, kind of on the side, on the main branch of Cockpit. Uh, with a configure option. So all the releases that you've been getting in between, they were still using the trusted old bridge. But just last week, we fixed the last critical regression that we noticed, and we felt it is now finally time to unleash it to the public to get more, more field testing. So just three days ago, we released this Python bridge provide to Fedora Rawhide, to Debian Unstable, soon in testing, hopefully, and thanks to Yala, also to Arch. And so we now want to let this settle down a little bit, collect regression reports, and as soon, like as long as nothing like dramatic happens, we will also want to soon release the Python bridge to Fedora 8 and RHEL and CentOS 9. But we will, like, we want to be cautious, so we will not change the Debian stable backports, the Ubuntu LTS backports, and the RHEL 8 updates because these are long-term support releases, and yeah, we are still not completely sure of ourselves. But that Daibut magic functionality that you've seen uh, with our demo, for now this is only available in the Flatpak. For now in the beta, that's released. You can try it out yourself from the Flatpak beta channel. And hopefully soon uh, also in the regular Flatpak. And we also want to deploy to the cockpit WS container. That's sort of the Kubernetes cloud server-side uh, equivalent of Flatpak. If you cannot run the Flatpak, for example, you have a Windows or mobile client, but of course, all these operating systems that I mentioned, they will be supported as connection targets. So you will, will be able to connect to Debian Stable or RHEL 8 with the flat package to, to these operating systems which don't have any cockpit packages installed. And yeah, so, oh, and of course, these distro and the container worlds, they are separate use cases for now because we're still having some discussions and try to figure out where we want to go with this. So there is some, let's say, colliding architecture uh, design decisions that we need to do, but for now we are mostly looking for feedback. <clears throat> so um, if you have any questions or you want to try it out and don't and you run into trouble, please don't hesitate to contact us. So we have a homepage. Uh, yeah, this one. Uh, we, we have a release block. The last, yeah. <laughs> So the, the, the latest release blog will show you how to install the flat pack and of course uh, give all the other contact information like our repository. You can find us on Matrix these days and the mailing list and so on. So, time for questions I think. Uh, so the question was, can you p run PSFX again with the pseudo bridge? Of course. Uh, if you do just FX, you won't see the pseudo one, right? Yeah, but I think with PSFXA. So you see, we've got this nice tree here. So this is the original. Oops. So this is the original SSH login. Uh, no, this one. Yeah. This is the Python bridge, and now this is the magic where we run pseudo. 
and then have the, the Python interpreter again. And of course, that's the thing that runs as root. I think it won't show the user here, but yeah. So that's the tree that we expect, like this kind of staged, uh, self-replicated thing. <coughs> okay, this? Does Bybook work if you import anything in compiled components? Sorry? If you import a library that has compiled components, does Bybook work with that? No. Um, Repeat the question. Oh, right. Uh, the question is if uh, you have a Python library that has like C code in it, for example, if Bybot is working with that. Uh, the answer is definitely no. Um, we def we um, made this stuff specifically for avoiding this case that we have to compile stuff. And then um, I'm pretty sure that if you had like a SO file or something, that, that needs to be on the file system for the dynamic linker to find it. And yeah, remember, I mean, we, the only assumptions that we want to make is pseudo, uh, SSH and Python. So this thing you uh, log into, this could be an ARM machine or like an S390 server or who knows. So maybe there's some cool tricks you can play with. Uh, uh, with, with uh, what is it? Oh. Never mind. No. So the question is how we start services from Python? Yeah, so this is um, maybe a bit of an interesting question that dives into the architecture of what we did in the Python bridge. Um, we do most stuff in Cockpit Bridge over Dbus. And this was one of the first components. We're like, okay, how are we going to hit Dbus from Python? Uh, because this is not part of the standard Python library. And we decided something that's pretty universal. I mean, Cockpit's not going to do very much without it. It's actually systemd. And libsystemd has a Dbus library inside of it, um, which does not contain Python bindings. Um, but what we did, and maybe this also is interesting for you, is we have a fairly comprehensive uh, binding of dbus uh, using systemd, using ctypes. Uh, and this runs everywhere. Uh, because it's, it's pure ctypes, you just need to open the library file, which we assume is installed, <laughs> and then you don't need to compile anything. How does it run on embedded systems, which doesn't have It doesn't. So the question was, how does it run on embedded systems which doesn't have systemd? But yeah, that's outside of a use case. I must also say, Cockpit in general doesn't run without systemd. So yeah, like everything here is like network manager yeah. and like pretty yeah. high level stuff. And half of the system and uh, the overview page is systemd. <coughs> so. hmm. hmm? Would you recommend or use Python as like a packaging format to just distribute? Yeah. Uh, um, would you use? Uh, I say by pack as a, as a packaging format to distribute programs. I'd say like by pack is you could like you can take a by pack and just cat it into the Python interpreter and if you don't care about standard in working then that actually works. Uh, I feel like it's very specific as a format to be used with, with by both though. Yeah my gut feeling is treated more like a compiler than like a distribution file almost. So. Yeah, like you, you would bypack during your build process and that becomes part of the deliverable that you delivered through another mechanism. Okay. Thanks very much. Seems to be exhausted, everyone. Well, thanks for your attention.